Benjamin, what are you doing in Monterey at the moment? I'm here uh, looking at the uh, curriculum setup of the uh, uh, TNI programs and uh, TLM program, mm -hmm. Translation and Localization Management program, mm -hmm. uh, because we recently got a Master of Translation and Interpreting uh, program approved by the uh, State Ministry of Education. In where? In, in which country? In China. Okay, you're from China and you're in Monterey. Yes. And uh, okay. So, so the idea is is what to set up a program in localization training. In yes. In China. In China. Okay. Where where in China are you? Uh, we are in the province of Zhejiang, which mm -hmm. is uh, southeast of Shanghai. Mm -hmm. We are about three hours away from Shanghai. Okay. And we're in the in the town of Jinghua, which has uh, half a million people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we want to uh, explore the possibility of setting up a, a master's program in localization, basically. Probably can can you tell me something about uh, the localization industry in China? Uh, right now, it's quite chaotic. There's a lot of localization uh, work uh, being done mm -hmm. in China. Um, and uh, well, we have uh, a few uh, big companies like Lionbridge, uh, Highsoft, and Seasoft, uh, specialized in localization. But we also have other companies like Transen, Transen, and Yuanpei, uh, who um, who are regular um, translation companies, but with okay. uh, uh, a localization component. So some them. of these are uh, multinational. Localization companies, yes, and others are ch big Chinese companies. Yes, these are, are okay. uh, yeah, um, domestic companies, um, and none of them are public. Okay, like Lionbridge is a public right. multinational uh, corporation, okay. and uh, I, I believe uh, CSoft is also well. It's based in China, but mm. they have branches in in other countries as well. Okay, uh, is this an important uh, source of employment for translators in China? Do you have uh, many translators going into localization companies or, or not? Uh, well, I guess when you say translators, um, you know, we didn't have mm. uh, programs, university programs yeah. training translators per se yeah. uh, prior to uh, 2006. Uh, so, uh, you know, well, there were some. Well, they were uh, English programs okay. or language programs, okay. uh, they were not uh, translation programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so people who have been working in the industry as translators, yes, they, they go on to uh, localization jobs. But also uh, the localization industry uh, gets a lot of uh, people from the IT industry mm -hmm. and uh, you know, project, project management, uh, which can be in any, any kind of management uh, you know, sector. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of people also are from the um, uh, you know graphic design or printing industry because there's a, a desktop publishing component mm -hmm. to localization. So, so if you were to set up a program to train people for localization, what skills do you have to give them in addition to language skills? Well, I think you know translation skills. Uh, mm -hmm. If that's not part of the you know language uh, skills, mm -hmm. I think uh, they need to know how to to translate, um, and also uh, you know project management skill, mm -hmm. uh, skills, um, managing projects. And actually, when I was at Limebridge, uh, actually uh, we had um, many project coordinators uh, who who would be calling overseas. They would be you know working. Uh, not working the daytime but at night time uh, and calling overseas to manage the project. So manage people in ch in Beijing, Beijing managing projects, managing projects outside. Yeah, okay. outside because uh, we were working with uh, fifty different languages in Beijing, and so many of the pro uh, many, many of the projects were outsourced to maybe Mongolia or Hungary, you know, countries like that. Okay. Uh, so hold on. That's projects being outsourced from the United States to Beijing, to Beijing. and you outsourced to Mongolia. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, we, we, we didn't directly out, but you know, the headquarters, they outsourced to Mongolia. Okay. But they were managed by Beijing, okay. Beijing team because many of the desktop, uh, desktop publishing uh, you know, uh, operations were done by the Beijing staff. Okay. So we had to have uh, coordinators who were 
you know, coordinating these projects. Is that outsourcing because labor costs are lower? Yes. But well, some of it, it's because of labor costs, like, mm -hmm. you know, we outsource some of the, uh, the uh, uh, English, you know, tran well, trans translation into, into English mm. to India or yeah, you know, yeah. countries like that. But some of it, it's because of the particular language. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the competency in other areas, so okay. they would outsource to the particular country okay. that where the target language, you know, originates. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, a lot of work into English being done in mm -hmm. India these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, how did you get into this? You mentioned you worked for Lionbridge, but how did you get to where you are? Well, uh, when I first graduated from college, I, I I taught in the same department for ten years. I taught listening comprehension and spoken English, mm -hmm. and then I came to the United States to get my uh, uh, master's degree in TESOL um, and then went on to a uh, uh, graduate program, a doctoral program at the uh, Ohio State University's mm -hmm. uh, School of Journalism and Communication. And uh, so I, I majored in TESOL uh, in my master's program and uh, uh, communication uh, with uh, visual communication um, orientation in my uh, PhD program. And after I graduated, I went to um, um, Mount Royal College now, called Mount Royal University in Canada, mm -hmm. and I taught um, um, electronic publishing there. Um, okay. I taught history publishing, uh, which I didn't, you know, even had any training, and I taught uh, web design, graphic design, okay. digital photography, and then uh, and then I went back to China, okay. uh, and I taught digital photography. And then I went to Beijing to work for this um, website called in uh, Bowen One, which is uh, a sus subsidiary of uh, How Stuff Works International. They were localizing the House How Stuff Works uh, site mm -hmm. into Chinese, and I was uh, in charge of the whole operations there. And uh, and and Align, which was actually a vendor of ours, they were doing the translation for us, so I got to know the mm -hmm. company. And then later on, I went to Lionbridge to be a, a language quality assurance manager there. So uh, Lionbridge is currently the biggest translation localization company in the world? Yes, uh, yes, okay. yes. Uh, does that give you, your background then has gone through language to visual communication. Does that give you a different look on what localization means? Do you yeah. think other people are too restricted to the word? A translator might be thinking too much about the word or, or is it well, t for me personally, I think it gives me a kind of uh, overall perspective of the whole, you know, I know pretty much the whole, uh, you know, the, I have pretty much the skill sets mm -hmm. in, in the whole process of localization from, you know, uh, putting your uh, files together and then decompose it and then have, have it translated and then put it back again at a desktop, a desktop publishing uh, part. So I think I benefited a lot from my experience, okay. and that's why I think people hired me uh, at uh, How Stuff in, uh, How Stuff Works International and Lionbridge mm -hmm. when I was first hired because of my experience in these different areas. I think also um, when I look at it, um, the, the the process of localization, um, I, I think also the you know the, the communication part helps a lot because it's it's basically uh, conveying messages across yeah. you know different languages and, and different cultures so so it, it does um, provide me uh, with a kind of unique perspective I, I, I think well, when you set up a program to train people for localization who are your teachers who's going to te do, do you have enough people with experience of industry to, to to train people properly? Right now it's it's very difficult to get people from the industry to work at the university because our universities look at people's credentials with uh, emphasis on academic achievements, publications and you know academic teaching positions, prior teaching yeah. experience and things like that. But I think uh, there's a kind of a paradigm shift uh, in, the, uh, in 2006 when the uh, Ministry of Education decided to uh, have these professional uh, master's programs going. I think it's changing, but it's very difficult uh, at the uh, you know at the university level because they're still looking at people through these uh, you know filters. 
Uh, but I think, uh, you know, for me, I would uh, get, you know, the regular faculty members who are teaching in the current translation programs or uh, literary, you know, um, English language mm -hmm. programs, they can teach some of the courses, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on translation skills, and then I can get people from the industry to okay. teach the project management yeah. and also the testing, the, you know, the, the other part of the, uh, uh, the process. So, um, you know, we're, make, we're trying to make this happen, yeah. but, but there's a lot of hurdles to jump through, I think. Do you think any research is needed on localization processes? Or, or what would be some interesting topics for people to do research on? Um, for, for China right now, it's, yeah. a <coughs> it's a blank piece of paper right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you type in, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Chinese version of localization, Bandihua, into the Google search engine or any database or any academic ba database, it's really difficult to find anything substantial about about localization. So I think uh, we we definitely need a lot of uh, a lot of uh, research to be done in that area, uh, and I think maybe uh, at the initial stage it'll be basically trans, you know, kind of uh, importing. Uh, you know, whatever research that's existing in, in, in the Western it's Hemisphere much. To, to, <laughs> yeah. to China yeah. and, uh, and, you know, kind of get uh, people to be interested in that and once we get to a particular um, level, then we can start to provide data maybe for Western researchers or have joint, you know, uh, projects going on. Yeah. So I, I think right now we're just at, uh, at the very beginning of, uh, of you know, the education. Uh, the well, what about uh, machine translation with Chinese? Uh, are people using that now as a, as a working tool? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, students are using it. Uh, uh, for, unfortunately, the professors are not using it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the students are using it. People in the industry, uh, translators, especially freelance translators, they're using it on a daily basis. I know that my colleagues at Lionbridge, they use it every day. And it's especially good for translating from Chinese to English uh, because it provides you with a lot of uh, you know resources mm -hmm. for you to to choose the best wording you know sentence structure uh, so on and so forth. So okay, uh, but it might be something we would want to do research on to know if it's good or bad in the end, or if it's really productive, or what goes on in the translator's mind. Yeah, right now it's I think it's it's kind of like a myth. Especially, you know, people who are doing machine translation are usually in the school of business or yeah. in the school of information technology, and we don't have any uh, linguists uh, involved. Uh, I've seen, uh, you know, these translation engines done uh, by, for example, the Chinese Academy, uh, the, the the Chinese uh, the Science Academy of China. Mm -hmm. I mean, they barely have any any linguists involved in in, in, in those projects. So. It'll be interesting to, to incorporate people who <coughs> specialize in translation in these projects mm -hmm. and uh, see what kind of effect you know, machine translation will have on the uh, translator and the industry and you know, so on and so forth. Okay. Okay, Benjamin, thank you very, very much for your time. You're very welcome. Okay. Thank you.